chapter 2 is equally really important because without being able to draw on and locate what you're doing in the scholarly conversation, you're not producing scholarship. So this is really, this is really important, your chapter 2. Okay, what I want to do before we have tea is to just look at an example of an extract from a literature review in one of the journals. But my numbering six. It's from an article by <coughs> Prince Lu et al. Raising Awareness of the Risk of Failure in First Year Accounting Students. And it's published in Accounting Education. Okay, um, so just starting at the top of that page. This is part of the literature where um, the authors are talking about different models explaining and mapping student experience. And one of the things that we see here is there are assertions, right? Some assertions are in the writer's voice. Some, sometimes there's authority or evidence for what the writers say drawn from the literature. Some assertions are in the voice of the source. So have a look, the very first sentence. There are further models explaining and mapping student experiences. There the writer is making an assertion um, and then he goes on to support that by giving examples, drawing them from the, from the literature. So he talks about Tinto's model of student integration, psychological model of being and eaten, the 3P model of learning by Biggs and Ramsden's contextual model. Okay, so he gives you four references, four examples to support the fact that He's made an assertion, there are a number of different models. Then we get him also asserting a different kind of model. So can you see what he's doing? He's now giving an exposition of what's out in there in the literature. He's selected this particular area. He's decided he's going to talk about models because this will be important for him, as for them, I should say, as the, as the paper goes along. So he's focusing on models and he's giving different types of models. Each time he draws on the literature in order to give examples to show what these kinds of, of models are. And then he goes sort of into, it's quite interesting all the different levels here. If you look, um, the sentence there are also different models predicting student persistence and dropout. Then he expands on that a little bit in his own voice. The fact that a student persists and decides to re-register for the module just failed can be explained using these different models. This is important for him to say because in the paper he's going to talk about students who failed and then redid a, mod um, a, a module immediately. So he's drawing from the literature and moving the discussion towards where he wants it to go, they want it to go. Okay, exploring the different models of Tinto, Kemba and Bean and Eaton, York states. So now what we have here is, he actually gives a quotation from York, explaining to us that York is drawing on a number of different models. So you can see there's sort of levels here to this representation of the field. He doesn't just say York says something. He indicates for us that York is drawing on the models that he's talked about. So what York has to say is going to pull together a whole lot of things in an interesting way. He wants to do this because he then wants to address York's point of view. So York's point of view is already pulling together some of the literature um, and he says York states that and he puts in a quotation 
wide range of theorizing that can be brought to bear on retention and persistence suggests that it will be formidably difficult to construct a grand predictive or explanatory theory. And then he goes on, that's the end of the quotation. He seems to echo the sentiment of Tinto. So what's our writer doing here now? Commenting on York's statement by comparing it with what Tinto had to say. So there's a sort of a depth here. Sometimes you read a literature review and it seems thin. You just get so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that and then in connection with this so-and-so, another so-and-so said something else. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a sense of layers or depth, but this writer is achieving a sort of sense of a representation of the field. There are these models, there are these different theorists, they relate to each other. You get the sense of this conversation, don't you? Going across the table. <laughs> And you notice the voice coming through of the, the writers themselves. Um, the, 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 I'm going to say the writer because that makes it easier. He seems to echo the sentiment of Timto. That little expression seems, that tentative statement is signaling that this is the writer's take on, on what um, is being said here who as early as 1982 warned that the very fact that he's reporting what Tinto said in 1982 as a warning tells us something about the writer's own viewpoint. Can you see the connection with where the writer is going? Warned. In other words, he's saying what Tinto said was something that we don't really want to hear, but we need to listen to, we need to take account of it. He warned that the different theories and models trying to explain student retention and student disengagement are limited, and our attempts to intervene are only partially successful. So what's he doing? He's constructing an argument. By dint of giving this rich representation of the field, he's achieving his own purposes pulling together the models, the relationships between the models, how they, they um, reflect on each other, and landing up at the end of this paragraph with the indication that this is a field and a topic and a problem that's really not being dealt with and it's really worth dealing with. So there's our value and our gap. Just in this one paragraph, it's just a little microcosm. Um, now, he, there's a lot of other parts of the literature review in this paper, and the writer is presenting arguments all the time. And each argument is building up for the, um, for the purpose, the, the problem, the, the question that the paper will address. If you look at the next paragraph, from these different theories and models, there's a nice um, um, meta-discourse. Did we talk, use the word term meta-discourse last, last time? Text about text. Um, you remember we said that in um, introductions, very often we're using text about text. We say chapter two, we'll do this, chapter three, we're referring forward, okay? Even within a, in paragraphs, we do this all the time in scholarly writing. It gets the flow, it integrates everything together. So a new paragraph from these different theories and models referring to the theories and models all discuss. So just that expression, these different theories and models, is like a little summary <laughs> of everything that's gone before. It seems as if the most one can state. So he's continuing here to give his own critical understanding of what the literature has revealed. It seems as if the most one can state, but again notice that language of tentative, um, tentative statement seems the most one can state is that students' persistence results from a dynamic interplay between personal, institutional, and broader contextual. Um, 
in the absence of what Merton calls a grand theory, Tinto continues by asserting that our theoretical models serve to explain only a portion of the wide range of behaviors. Now, it's so important for this writer to be establishing the, the gap, to be establishing the significance of this, that there's a whole second paragraph that is um, picking up on this. Also, all interleaved with the literature. So he's still using the literature to, to do this. York attempts to summarize the implications of the different models and look at the language that's chosen there. York attempts to summarize. There's no easy way out. York has summarized it, but it's an attempt. <laughs> He's not entirely um, indicating that this has been successful or that this answers the problem. And that's really important. York attempts to summarize the implications of these different models on student retention and states that student persistence, and again he quotes, is influenced by a variety of factors, but that it is students' perceptions of their learning experiences and how they have been treated by providers of courses that are likely to be of prime significance. Tinto adds, leaving is not the mirror image of staying. Knowing why students leave does not tell us, at least not directly, why students persist. Now, the field, the topic that these <coughs> writers are addressing is why students redo a module that they failed. So that's the persisting, you see. So this is a lovely quotation here. And we can talk about when you paraphrase, when you summarize, when you quote. It's really important for this writer to have this quotation here because it exactly addresses what the issue is. That all these models about why students leave, why they fail, why they aren't retained in institutions and in courses of study, those models are all very well, <laughs> but they don't tell us why students come back and do it again. And that's what the, what the issue is. And then the next paragraph takes up a slightly different thread here. There is also a variety of published research on specific interventions focusing on at-risk students. So this is another thread. But this thread here around the models, you can see how carefully woven and wrought and crafted it is in order to provide relevant information, to show the breadth and the depth of the reading, to indicate the writer's own stance with regard to what he's writing about, and to show that what has been done in the literature up to now has not addressed the problem. In fact, it's acknowledged as a problem in the literature, and by careful use of sources and that sort of sense of depth where sources are drawn together and compared and people who have um, reported on those sources in their writing are reported on, um, th the writer is achieving this particular argument, achieving this particular purpose. And if you think back about the model we talked about, think about the content, the writer, and the audience, all of those have been addressed. There's important information that has been put forward here. These writers have positioned themselves as scholars in the field, as part of the scholarly conversation. They understand the conventions of the literature review, the genre of of literature review, and they have related to their reader and achieved the purposes that they know their reader has as well, by focusing the reader into agreeing with where they want to go, but doing it in such a way that they're not aggressive and too assertive in the statements that they're making. So a really nice example of the kind of literature review work that um, you will be doing in your, in your own scholarly writing. Okay. Any comments or questions? 
Well, we overcome with delight <laughs> at Prince Louis et al. <laughs> I'm overcome with delight. <laughs> There's some things in here you might want to comment on. You might want to ask why Tinto, uh, why, um, Tinto is quoting Merton and the writers here are not going back to Merton, but they rather, I don't know, did anybody pick that up in the, um, in paragraph two, the second sentence, in the absence of what Merton calls a grand theory, quoted by Tinto, Tinto continues by asserting that our theoretical models serve to explain. Sometimes people ask me, are you allowed to do this? Are you allowed to, to cite things that have been cited by other people? What do you think? What, what are your practices? I mean, you're all, you're all experienced in academic writing to lesser or greater extents, but we're all, we're all doing academic writing. So, so what's our take on this? What do you think? I think, personally, I prefer to go directly to the, I was the writer here too much, but I think maybe the reason why it's been done this way is to sort of, his formula in Tinto's idea, and Martin has just contributed to that. Maybe that's the reason. But personally, I prefer to do it the other way, but I don't write at this level yet. <laughs> so obviously I would never be able to. But I understand from if, if that's the reason why he did it, then it makes no sense. Okay. Anybody else got a comment to make? There's sort of genuinely a rule of thumb that you hear that in a master's dissertation, if you cite something that somebody else has cited, it's acceptable. Would you agree with that? But generally people say at a doctoral level, so those of you can grow, and you've got to go and find, you've got to go and find those original sources yourself. But I agree with what you're saying here. It's quite interesting because he's actually talking about what Tinto says, and he's saying that, in the absence of what Merton calls a grand theory, Tinto continues by asserting. So there, there is probably more of a reason there than just well. I didn't see Merton, but I did see Tinto, and so now I'm going to mention Merton. He actually wants to indicate what Tinto is doing, and at the same time refer to the source that Tinto draws on. And he uses that grand theory. He wants, you know, he quotes that phrase. So now he's got to actually indicate which page it came from. So he had. This is the thing with writing. They're judgment calls all the time. You're making choices all the time. That's why I think the model of content writer audience is important to bear in mind because those are the things that you should be thinking about when you make choices in your writing. Should I go back and find? Can I do this? What shall I use seams? Can I be more assertive here? Should I be, should I hedge it and make it a little bit more tentative? As a writer, you're asking yourself those things all the time because you've got a whole smorgasbord of choices before you as to how to approach things. Sue, <laughs> no, I thought you were dying to say something. <laughs> okay. Um, you notice the um, page, and anyway, we'll get onto that when we do reference it. But don't worry, I think it should have teeth. <laughs> Celebrate this point by having <laughs> on the issue of smorgasbord. Please <laughs> yes. go and enjoy the smorgasbord and, and tea. scholarly <laughs> dinner tables and things like that. We'll have tea. Shall we stay <laughs> ten minutes? Is that yeah, that's fine. To look at the literature review. What we wanted to achieve when we write a literature review. We looked at a, a small example from a literature review where we saw those kinds of. Um, purposes actually being achieved by the, the writer, you know, deliberately uh, put into place and, and built into their representation of that area of the, of the field. So now what we're going to look at is um, 
how we reference, how we cite, and perhaps why we cite. And also the whole notion of representing other people's voices and representing our voices. Some of the things we've actually started talking about when we looked at the, at the literature review. But what we'll do is um, we'll look at a few examples and see what we find in terms of the way um, the literature is being cited. And I'm going to encourage you to be quite critical because um, I'm sure that we can probably make suggestions to some of these writers. <laughs> anyway, we'll see as we go. Okay, now first of all, is it true that only scholars cite? Because sometimes people say, oh, you know, this citing thing, this referencing, it's only academic writing. Oh, it's such a, it's such a burden. <laughs> Why must we do this in our academic writing? So that's one question we, uh, that I want to look at. Is it true that only scholars cite? And then going on beyond that to look at why scholarly writing uses so much citation. Okay. Have a look at those, have a look at those bits from conversation. the neighbour testified that she had heard two screams from the house next door. You might recognise where that <laughs> might come from. <laughs> um, he was bruised so badly, the doctor says it was a miracle he survived. Now, obviously the style is very different from academic style. The principle is the same. You know, the, the, in the second one, the, the speaker is, is wanting to emphasise the extreme drama of the story about this person being hurt and so brings in the authority of the doctor. Doctor said it was a miracle he survived. Um, so she comes over and says, is that your car? And I'm like, what? Typical sort of story. He said, she said, they said, I said, you know, we do it all the time. So it's really not so odd that we, but somehow when it comes to academic writing, people get all tied up and sort of get nervous about citing. Nevertheless, it is true that academic writing is very heavily cited. If you had to look at a whole lot of texts, you'd be able to pick out the academic writing because it would have citations that looked different from that, first of all, and also there would be so much of it. And I think, sorry, I yes. comments about your loss. <laughs> yes. Um, and this goes to Brian's comments about the, the quality of the references. Yeah. Isn't that exactly what's happened in that court case, that they're trying to cast doubt on the credibility of that Absolutely. reference? Absolutely. Absolutely. Or that evidence or, you know, that testifier or whatever. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that, of course, is what law is all about. I always think it's so appropriate that the law school, the center of the school is the library. And you walk all around and you see people. And it's all about the word. It's all about, yeah, and, and, and those sources. And are they, uh, are they adequate or not? Yeah, no, absolutely. Right, so citing is something that we do all the time. But in academic writing, we get, we, we use a lot of it because academic conversation is, is, is the name of the game. And sources can provide facts to use as evidence in our 
arguments, ideas about facts, claims and concepts that other people have um, asserted or come up with, and sources also provide ways of for us to respond to other voices. When we talk about sources, we can then locate ourselves as responding to that conversation. All of which are very important things because academic, um, well, I suppose your legal case as well is all about argument. And so if you think, uh, you know, what Sue has just said, that that's really what the court case is all about, is saying whether these, um, this evidence is uh, believable or not. Um, law cases are all about argument. Academic writing is all about creating an argument. Um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> I think I was going to take it somewhere, but let's let's move on. It just fascinated me suddenly the the, the comparison with the, the case and law. Okay, so why do we reference them in academic writing? We're using all these voices, we're citing and we have to use the conventions of referencing. We have to indicate our sources in order to tell the reader very clearly and specifically and according to the conventions, the evidence, uh, where the evidence for what you write comes from. So the reader should be able to find the source. Um, maybe somebody wants to follow up on some interesting bit of evidence that you've produced for their own purposes. It's all part of the conversation. So they may need to be able to find your source. The reader needs to be able to understand the nature of the source. What kind of a source is it? Um, is it believable? Can I actually, is it credible? What kind of source is it? If you cite, then it's clear to the reader what kind of source this is. Because your citation links with your reference list with the full, the full reference, um, and your reader will be able to follow it up. The reader also needs to be able to form an opinion about the use you are making of the source. So if the reader doesn't know exactly what what you, where what you're saying comes from, they can't really form an opinion about the use you're making of the source. Now that sounds like the examiner as the reader, doesn't it? Yeah. And the reader can assess the quality and range of your research. So these are some of the reasons then why we have so much citation in academic writing. You know, you open a, a journal article and there are lots and lots and lots of citations. Those are all the, the, the reasons why. Okay, and then, you know, I'm not going to apologize for saying all of this again because sometimes we need to be reminded. Um, we were, one of the first things we talked about at the beginning here was using other texts without plagiarizing. So sometimes it helps us to just be reminded about when do we cite? When do we reference? We reference when we use information, facts, specific details that we get from somewhere else. When we report what others have said. We reference in order to acknowledge when we use the ideas and arguments of another author. We acknowledge that these ideas, these words come from some other source. We reference when we quote, when we use the exact words of the source. Now we've had lots of examples of exactly um, those things happening. Um, specific details about the models in that literature, a little extract from a literature review we looked at. Where those were reported, we found citations. The authors who were responsible for the ideas that were being discussed, we found citations. When the source was quoted, we 
he found citations with the page reference as well. When we restate in our own words a point or a finding or an argument an author has made, we need to cite. Sometimes I find that postgrad students, certainly at the beginning, when they sort of get into um, the ways of scholarly writing, think that if you're quoting, you cite. If you're paraphrasing, 